Hey guys, welcome back to the show. And on this episode, I'll be talking about a movie titled The Devil Within Her. However, I prefer the British title, I Don't Want to Be Born. I became interested in this movie the second I laid eyes on the poster. Because, I mean, just look at this thing. Like, what the hell is going on here? Now, to be clear, this is not what the baby actually looks like. In the movie, it has a typical upper body with arms, head, and a face. However, I will say that seeing this thing running around probably would have been a lot scarier than what they had in the movie. Released in 1975, you could easily make the argument that this movie attempted to capitalize on the success of The Exorcist and to a lesser extent Rosemary's Baby by using elements from each movie. But instead, what comes out actually feels more like a parody of these movies. The movie starts with Lucy, played by Joan Collins, trying to give birth when suddenly the doctor, played by Donald Pleasance, reveals that... This one doesn't want to be born. Well, that's kind of a weird thing to say during childbirth. I mean, I'm just wondering what led him to come to that conclusion. What indication would a fetus give that it doesn't want to be born? Did it just peek its head out like, hey, you know what? I, I can see what's going on here. I am just not comfortable with this situation. So, just leave me inside, please. But this whole sequence really sets the tone for the entire movie because it's extremely awkward and confusing. There are some odd choices here when it comes to direction and performance. In fact, if you watch it on mute, you'd probably have no idea what was actually going on. There's no real visual cues to tell you this is a childbirth. If anything, you might think that they're preparing her for some kind of weird sexual encounter with a light fixture. And the music really doesn't help either. Again, this is something you'll notice throughout the entire movie. The score doesn't add any kind of tension or suspense. It takes any of that away from it. I understand that it was the 70s, but The Omen came out a year after this and it managed to have an effective score. Have no fear, little one. I am here to protect thee. So while this is going on, her husband Gino is in the waiting room, doing what people did in the 70s, flipping matches. I imagine a box of matches was like the fidget spinner of the 70s. Small, cheap, compact, popular amongst kids. Much more potentially dangerous though. Gino is an Italian businessman, but I have no idea what is going on with this accent. It seems to change throughout the movie. Congratulations, Mr. Carlos. It's a boy. Marvelous. Is Lucy all right? Oh, yes, yes, she's fine now. It was a bit of a struggle, man. Oh, but the baby's all right. Now, about feeding. Well, she said she wanted to feed him herself. No, I don't think that would be No, she told idea. me she wanted to so much. And as I said, he's an amazingly big and strong baby. But the baby's all right. No. They called Uncle Giorgio a giant, but he was only five foot ten. Hmm? <laughs> I think we're going to have a six footer on our hands one day. So after the baby cuts her face somehow, must have been those razor sharp baby nails everybody talks about. They bring the baby home to their housekeeper and decide to go ahead and grab a drink. You know, leave the baby alone with the door closed. I'm sure he's sick of you guys already. And if there's one thing you want to do after giving birth and coming home, it's getting some hard alcohol back into your system as soon as possible. Remember, this is the 70s. You gotta start getting back to normal here. You know, get, get back to your regular you and you've got nine months of drinking to catch up on. One thing you'll notice is that there are a lot of shots of driving in this movie. I understand wanting to establish the environment, showing a passage of time, whatever, but there's a lot of this. And in addition with the music, it doesn't exactly set the tone that the movie is going for. Anyways, Lucy's friend Mandy comes over for a visit, and by a visit, I mean alcohol. Are you still on scotch? Yes, but never before breakfast. <laughs> what? Never before breakfast? 
<laughs> That's where you draw the line? How much of a concern was this to warrant making the rule in the first place? Yes, I've decided to cut down on the booze a bit. Yeah, I got a new rule for myself, okay? No, no drinks before breakfast. But after I'm done those scrambled eggs, that orange juice is gonna turn into a screwdriver in no time. Like, how early were people hitting the bottle back then? Yep, okay, that's it. Not before breakfast. Some scotch with my lucky charms is one thing, but before? <laughs> Come on now, we're, we're trying to live in a society here. Okay. I also love how Lucy has to check her watch to be like, well, it's technically after breakfast, so bottoms up. Suddenly, they hear all this noise coming from upstairs, which leads them to find the baby's room completely trashed and the baby holding on to the torn off head of one of the dolls. And what's the reaction to all of this? Come on, come on, you need a drink. Yes, let's have a drink. Seems like... Seems like, seems like that time of day. There seems to be no serious concern as to what exactly happened here. I mean, if this couldn't have been the baby, as she said, then maybe there's something else going on. Maybe it was just a lot of wind coming through the window. Let's at least take the baby out of this room where things seem to be flying around. I'm getting the feeling that this is how a lot of people dealt with pretty much all of their problems in the 60s and 70s? I don't know, I wasn't born in the 70s, I was born in the 80s, when we all know cocaine held that title. But looking back at all of this casual binging in movies and TV shows, Mad Men's a good example, I'm struck by just how impractical this all is. Based on the frequency of pours from the bottle, at what point does the glass become redundant and the most efficient method come in the form of taking the glass back to the kitchen and exchanging it for a straw. You know, just basically cutting out the middleman entirely. Lucy starts telling the story about how it all started when she was giving her last performance at the club. This performance includes a dwarf. I'm guessing this is the Hunchback of Notre Dame and it's either an erotic version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, or this club just has a wide variety of late night entertainment. Oh, you're gonna wanna be here on Saturday nights. Yes, it's theater at nine, strippers at 10. Backstage, Lucy offers the dwarf, whose name is Hercules, a drink, but he turns it down in favor of some unwanted groping. So then Tommy comes in, kicks Hercules out, and she has sex with him instead. Then on her way out, Hercules appears, and I guess, What's a curse on her? You will have a baby, a monster, an evil monster conceived in your womb, as big as I am small and possessed by the devil himself. And I'm just wondering, like, does, does he have some kind of magic power? Is he some kind of evil being or sorcerer or something like that? Because that can't just be all it takes. Just, you will have a baby, and it happens. So Gino's sister has flown in from Italy to see the baby. Anyways, she makes the sign of the cross, and the baby starts freaking out. And they try to make the baby sound strange by putting what sounds like a rainstorm over the screaming sounds. <laughs> If you're gonna imply that the baby is some kind of demonic being or the devil himself through the sounds the baby makes, you're gonna have to do something to the actual sounds the baby makes. Not just lay some environmental sound effects over it, that just doesn't make sense. So you think there might be something wrong with your baby? Yes, he's crying a lot, and there's also some thunder and rain along with the crying. One of the things I really liked about The Exorcist was the sound design. I think they did a really good job at combining different voices, creature sounds, and various breathing and wheezing sound effects to help convey that Reagan was truly being possessed by something that was not of this world. Hello, Reagan. I'm a friend of your mother's. I'd like to help you. You want to loosen the straps, huh? I'm afraid you might hurt yourself, Reagan. I'm not Reagan. Where's Reagan? In here with us. Your mother's in here with his cars. Would you like to leave a message? I see that she gets it. Anyways, they hire a nanny to take care of the baby, and one night after they come home, by the way, I, I have no idea what's going on with this shot. It probably would have been a good idea to just take it again. 
they find the nanny is being held underwater. And you might notice this is obviously a very big hand, not a baby sized hand. And this hand will pop up again, like the next day, when the nanny takes the baby for a walk along the water, she stops to admire the view and suddenly the baby's hand pops up and pushes her in, killing her. Okay everyone, so the next shot is gonna be the shot of the baby's hand pushing the nanny into the water. So we'll need someone to stand in as the baby's hand. All right, so who here has the hairiest knuckles? Now, to be fair, I believe that this hand was supposed to look like this for a reason. I think it's a reference to Hercules the dwarf because Lucy has started seeing Hercules in place of the baby, but that actually makes this whole thing even more confusing. What is the connection that Hercules has to all of this? Does he have some kind of power that allows him to take the place of the baby in certain instances to commit these acts? Another one of the big problems with the movie is that it never feels like it's building up to anything. There's no real urgency or suspense or even just an overall feeling that it has to lead to anything. Especially when you throw in moments like this that I guess are supposed to be scary but just come off as funny. <laughs> So now we have Gino just going around town, doing stuff for a really long time. Gino walking, 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 buying things, walking some more, more walking. None of this actually has any point. This is more than halfway through the movie, so it's not like it's establishing environment anymore and it's not progressing the story or developing the character. If you want to throw this in here as something to cut away to, to show a passage of time, okay, fine, whatever. But why does it have to be so long? And speaking of scenes that run on too long, you might not be surprised to hear that this movie has one of the staples of the bad movie genre, something that has made multiple appearances on this show, the long, boring sex scene. But after that's over, we finally get to the good stuff on this movie. And by good stuff, I mean hilariously bad stuff. Gino goes into the baby's room and finds that the baby's missing and the window's been broken. And then we hear the sound of what I assume is Hercules snickering. Either that or Muttley has found his way into their backyard. <laughs> And I love the reaction here, it's not, oh shit, oh my god, the window's broken, the baby's missing! It's, it's more like, as if he's looking for an animal that's been sneaking into the backyard at night and digging up the garden. Finally, he looks up into the tree and the baby drops down a noose, which, <laughs> I guess, tightens around his neck and lifts him into the air, killing him before he's able to just, you know, take it off. Then the baby... <laughs> <laughs> the baby then stuffs the body into the drain outside and part of what makes it so hard to take this movie seriously is picturing the baby actually physically doing these things. It doesn't matter that the baby has like super demon strength or whatever, just imagining the baby sitting in a tree and lifting up a grown man with a rope is just hilarious. Like, this is some Looney Tunes type shit. In movies like The Omen or Village of the Damned, the children weren't terrifying and dangerous because of the physical force they had. It was the fact that they didn't have to do anything physically. They possessed supernatural powers which caused horrible things to happen or made people do harm to themselves, and this was far more terrifying. I also have to say, I think it's very hard in a movie to make a newborn baby appear terrifying. Unless, of course, you're David Lynch. But seriously though, with kids you can pull this off because at least you can give them some direction in terms of acting. Even if it's just to stand there and be monotone. Leave. Us. Alone. But babies can't take any direction. They don't know what's going on. And some of the scariest moments with babies are the ones that are given the treatment of the less that's shown, the better. This is one of the reasons why Rosemary's Baby was so effective. The whole movie was about Rosemary's Baby and the suspicions as to what was actually going on with the people around her and their intentions for her baby. When Rosemary's greatest fears are confirmed at the end of the movie and she sees her baby for the first time, it's what's implied that makes it scary. What 
have you done to it? What have you done to its eyes? He has his father's eyes. What are you talking about? Guy's eyes are normal. What have you done to him, you maniac? Satan is his father, not Guy. Keep in mind that the baby is never actually shown in this movie. But all we need as an audience is the reaction to create our own personally terrifying mental image. Anyways, the doctor comes over and when he finds that the baby isn't in its room, he goes outside and finds Gino's dead arm in the drain. And while he's standing there, I guess the baby creeps up behind him with the shovel and cuts his head off. And here we go. This is when the baby goes after Lucy. So she's pushing against the door to try and keep him from coming in and killing her. And for some stupid reason, she switches positions to right in front of the opening where obviously she's stabbed. This just makes no sense. I mean, why would you purposefully make yourself vulnerable in this situation? <laughs> You're trying to keep the door closed so that he can't come in and stab you. So why would you then move to the one spot where it is possible for him to stab you? So sister comes over and starts to do an exorcism and honestly, why doesn't the baby just kill her? I don't know. He found it pretty easy to kill everybody else. Anyways, back at the club, Hercules starts stumbling around the stage. And then once she's finished the exorcism, Hercules dies. So, again, what the hell? Like, what, what was going on with him? What is the connection here? What does he have to do with this whole thing? I guess he had some kind of demon connection to the baby. But why? Was he into witchcraft or something? Was he the devil? And I gotta say, if he was the devil, why would you pick the form of a dwarf working in a strip club? I mean, if it was women he was after, why wouldn't you just take the form of like an actor or famous actor, I don't know, like Hugh Jackman or... Who was famous in the 70s that was like a heartthrob? I don't know. I don't know, I, whatever. Why wouldn't you pick the form of like John Travolta or... I gotta tell you guys, I love doing these older movies. There's just so much to talk about, and I know they don't get as many hits and as much attention as uh, the videos I do on newer movies, but I'm trying to mix it up the best that I can. The next episode, however, will be on Highlander 2, a movie which is one of the stranger entries onto this show, um, if you can believe that. Uh, even though I know nothing can be, I don't think anything's gonna be stranger than deathbed, to be honest. But nonetheless, as always, thanks for watching guys. I'll see you next time. I mean, if it was women he was after, why wouldn't you just take the form of like an actor or famous actor, I don't know, like Hugh Jackman or I don't know, somebody successful like the, I don't know, the guy who invented Snapchat or some shit, I don't know. <laughs> Because in the 70s, they obviously knew what Snapchat was.